<coughs> Hello, this is Michael Hansen and I would like to present to you another one of my videos this time again about gravitational lensing. Now, the topic for today, or for, not for today, for this video is um, these two up here, critical lines and caustics. Now these are connected to each other as I will show later on and this is just to show you the, the topics. I will pause the video, erase it and then put up some new things on the board that we will work on. First I would like to talk about some general considerations about um, critical lines and caustics and then I'll introduce a bit of math to sort of um, explain or underline how these things work. Alright? Alright, so let's get started. Let's start by first discussing what are critical lines and what are caustics and how they're connected. Now critical lines come from the, the, the gravitational potential which comes from the distribution of the mass. So when we model our lens we sort of get actually we model the gravitational potential and then from that get the mass but they are interconnected. So from mass we can get the gravitational potential and from the potential itself in relation to that we can get the critical lines. So what are the critical lines? Well as you can see here there are an outer critical line and an inner critical line and as the color coded dots up here suggest they are connected to the way the images are, are formed. So we can see instantly that <clears throat> we can have five images, four images magnified and one central Im image very demagnified, highly demagnified. Another thing we can see is that this comes from an elliptical potential not a circular potential. If it were a circular potential we would have an Einstein ring in relation to this um, outer caustic sorry, this outer critical line. We can also see that whenever two images get close to a critical line they merge and they get highly magnified. We can see it here and we can see it here. <coughs> so that's the critical lines. The, with the caustics the, the, the story is somewhat the same but as we can see the caustics relate the images how many images and how they are formed to the position of the source so we have a central source we have a source close to a caustic to an inner caustic we have a source close to an outer caustic and we have a source outside the two caustics now as we also can see here the position of the source in relation to the caustics will give us the position of the images with relation to the critical lines. Now I've color coded the critical lines so that you can see that the inner critical line, sorry, the inner caustic is related to the outer critical line and the outer caustic is related to the inner critical line. But in actual it's the other way around. It is that the outer caustic, sorry, the outer critical line is related to the uh, inner caustic and the inner crit critical line is related to the outer caustic because the caustic, the caustics are the projection of the critical lines from the lens or the, the image plane down to the source plane. All right, so let's try to lay how we can derive image positions. Oh, let's first, I would also like first to state that as you can see, the, <coughs> the critical lines are always um, continuous. If you imagine a continuous function, a continuous function would be something like this. Whereas a discontinuous function would be something like this. That's a discontinuous function. You have a place where you can continue or even a better example something like this. This is discontinuous. Alright. This is not the story with the caustics. Now I will get into this later 
Well, I also introduced the math around this, but just to stay short, as you can see, that there's continuous segments of the inner caustic, but there's also discontinuous segments out here. Now, <clears throat> these segments here are called the fold caustic. Let's put it up. I think I'll use black for this. This is a fold. And this down here is a cusp. Sorry, that's not a very nice P. Cusp. Now, the names come from math, so it's mathematical definitions. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So let's try to, to see, and I'll also put in source positions and image positions to show you how we can derive, what we can derive from the caustics and the critical lines and what it can tell you about the image formation and the image position. So let's see. When we have a source in the middle, the green one here, we have five images. Four magnified image, images out here two on the outside of the outer critical line and two on the inside of the outer critical line and one highly demagnified source inside the inner critical line. Now the red part here, the red source here shows us it's close to a fold caustic. <clears throat> so when we have, whenever we have a source close to a caustic, inner caustic that is, you can see here that two of the images move towards this part of the critical line, almost merge and becomes highly magnified. This image out here moves a little upward, away from the position of the source, it's up here. And the outer image, one of the images outside um, the outer critical line gets a little bit demagnified, or not, or not as much magnified, and moves a little bit upwards. <clears throat> we still have five separate images. One, two, three, four, five. You can also see that this image out here moves a little downwards and becomes a little bit more magnified. Now, as the source, because I only have four colors, as the source moves outside the, critical, the, the inner caustic, <clears throat> This image here, that these two images here merge and vanishes as it crosses. And as you can see up here on the blue on the blue source, whenever we move close to the next, the outer caustic. Again, we have. No, let's just step backwards once. As you can see, when this source, we have removed one image or two images, so we have three left. When this source gets close to the outer caustic we can see that two images are preparing to merge and get highly magnified along the corresponding critical line. Again, we have these two images here. One image up here moves a bit outward and as you can see sort of closer to where the source is moving. And now the final image when we cross the outer critical line, sorry, the outer caustic, this one, these two images here merge and then as the source is positioned on top of the caustic, the images get merged, merges completely and get highly magnified, really magnified, and then as the source cross over the caustic, the images on the corresponding critical line vanishes. So. When the source is out here, outside both of the caustics, we have one image here outside the critical lines. So what does that tell us? It tells us that with the green source, we have five images. Five images. With the red source, we have three images when it's outside the critical line, caustic, sorry. 
and no, let's just say it's easier to use the blue. With the blue, we have three images, and with the black source, we have only one image left. So this is sort of the basic idea on how you, sh you should understand caustics and critical lines and how they can help us in understanding not only the position of the images but how many images we have and also that the inner caustic is related to the outer critical line and the outer caustic is related to the inner critical line and whenever a source cross a caustic the corresponding the images on the corresponding critical line will become highly magnified and eventually merge and then disappear as the source cross over the the, the caustic. All right. Next, I would like to talk about. I'll erase the board and put on some new things, and then give you the math the sort of mathematical def definition on how <clears throat> we get this. Um, and discontinuous part of the caustic. All right. Now, in order to show how we can mathematically define the critical lines and the caustics, let's try to imagine that we want to parameterize these critical lines. Now, since the critical lines are related to the this, the image position theta, we can parameterize the critical lines as theta with respect to lambda. All right. So in order to find how uh, the images um, look or how the, the critical lines the, the shape, we can look at um, the tangent to the critical line because the tangent at any given point will define the curvature of that part of the, of the line. So in order to parameterize such a um, uh, line we can define I'll call theta dot of lambda is equal to d theta d lambda sorry I'm not going to use two different types of lambdas I so somebody that has had I think almost just um, uh, high school um, experience with mathematics will know that any given point if you want to find the curvature if you want to find Let's say I want to find the tangent at this point. We will call it a normal function. We have y of x and x. We can also call that f of x as equal to y. We know that the, the tangent at this point is equal to dy dx. We can also call that f dot of x or f mark of x. I hope everybody knows or some. If you don't know it, you know it now. So this is simple, uh, a derivative in order to get the tangent. Actually, that's basically how the derivative is defined. But I also said that the caustic over here is um, a projection of the critical lines down on the source plane. So a parameterization, parameterization of the critical lines down to the, to, to the source plane, that is the caustics, we could call that beta of theta of lambda. And so again we can say in order to find the tangent here, we could say that um, d 
D, beta, theta of lambda over the lambda. Now, if we invoke something called uh, a, a derivation rule, I can't remember, it's called the chain rule. Yes. We can define it as d beta, d theta, d theta, d lambda. Now, d beta, d theta we know from somewhere else. We could call it the matrix A of theta of lambda. And this one over here, d theta, d lambda, we have here. We call that theta dot of lambda. Now, such a matrix uh, in gravitational lensing always had two eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues sort of define, you could call it a position on, on the on the um, on the on the caustic, and we have a, a, a when we have a situation where one of the eigenvalues in this matrix will always have the value zero. So there's one value that is non-zero and one eigenvalue that is zero. If we have a situation where the value of the eigenvalue with zero is perpendicular to this tangent here, we will have a fold caustic, a continuous function. But if we have a situation where the eigenvalue with zero is parallel to the tangent here, we will have a discontinuous section. As per se, when one of the eigenvalues, let's say, like this, eigenvalue with zero, I just call it zero, is perpendicular to the tangent, we have a fold. But if we have a situation where the eigenvalue, sorry, let's put it in the same order, the eigenvalue of the, with the value zero and the tangent, that is from this, is parallel, then we have a cusp. All right. So this is sort of the the mathematical way of saying that how the critical lines and the caustics are related, and to explain, relatively simple, but this is you can do much more with it. But just relatively simple explanation to show you how we can do these things. That when it comes to the caustics, let's say the outer critical line projected down to the inner caustic, we can have a situation where the lines is continuous when we have a full caustic, but we can also have a situation with uh, a discontinuous function like this arrow out here, um, or pointy part here, which we call a cusp. This whole part here we usually call an asteroid caustic because it looks like an asteroid function, asteroid uh, image. Like for example in the, in, in the card game, you can have asteroid. Alright, this should be it. In the next video I will show you some basic examples of when we put all of these things I have shown you in these videos together. We can get a basic good idea on how to model things, how to introduce the program I use called Lens Tool. But I will also show you model examples. I have printed out some examples that I can show you. Alright, bye.